يسرني أن أرحب بالبروفيسورة نادرة سويس بروفيسورة نادرة سويس She's not أهلا I'm going to keep it short to, to, to provide some time for discussions. So, uh, Professor Swiss is Professor of Medicine and Rheumatology at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, she has done an awful lot of research on sarcoidosis, on rheumatoid arthritis, and on scleroderma. And she's going to talk to us about highlights from the ACR <coughs> Chicago 2018. Assistant you have the floor, Professor. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I am honored to be here today, and um, great thanks to Dr. Uh, Basil Masri for his kind invitation, uh, to the uh, committee members, the support team, and the chairpersons. Uh, I was asked to give highlights uh, about the American College of Rheumatology meeting 2018 in Chicago. And actually, this is the first time I give such a talk. My area of expertise is sarcoidosis, which will be the topic of discussion tomorrow. Um, so it is extremely hard to summarize a meeting uh, in uh, 40 minutes. Uh, so the way I selected uh, which articles to present and which highlights to present was based on what thought leaders at the American College of Rheumatology uh, selected to be the best published articles in 2017, 2018, as well as the sessions that I attended. And I felt uh, from being in academic medicine for more than um, 23 years will be relevant to practice, especially practice in the Middle East. This is my disclosure statement. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, however, um, my presentation will uh, include discussions of F-label use of medications in some complex rheumatologic disorders. Um, I may show uh, patients' photos, and patients consented to share their photos for educational purposes. This is the outline of my talk and the source of the data. Um, in the first um, half of the talk, I will give you a summary of the published and unpublished work within the last two years that highlights the advanced, uh, advancements in the field of rheumatology. Uh, in the second part, I selected few cases from my clinical practice that were challenging uh, cases to treat and took me a couple of years to uh, reach uh, a conclusion or make a difference, and I thought it would be helpful uh, to share uh, with you. As far as the highlights, I divided the highlights by disease category. Uh, I will start with osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis <laughs> is an extremely common disorder. Each of us in this room, at one point of our life, will have aches and pains somewhere, whether it's back pain, knee pain, hip pain. So treatment of osteoarthritis um, it got a lot of attention the last few years given uh, the rise of the numbers of osteoarthritis in the United States and all over the world. I'll start with a study that was published in the JAMA 2018. And I will not go into the details of all the data or criticizing the study, whether the study um, had some limitations. I will merely present the question that was asked, the design of the study, and the implications, and my own personal view of the study. Um, this study looked at the effect of opioids versus non-opioids medications on pain-related function in patients with chronic back pain or hip pain, or neosteoarthritis pain. It was called the SPACE study. This was a randomized controlled trial. And the questions that was asked, are opioids superior to acetaminophen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for chronic pain? This was a randomized controlled study of 240 patients with chronic back pain or pain from hip or knee osteoarthritis. The study was well-designed, uh, well-conducted, and the result 
showed that uh, opioids uh, were not helpful. In a way, now we're going through the opioid crisis in the United States with many patients dying from opioid, opioid overuse, and a lot of patients with osteoarthritis are requiring uh, to use opioid for pain control. There was no difference on function between groups. Non-opioid group had less pain intensity, and opioid use should be avoided in the treatment of chronic musculoskeletal pain. We'll move on to the next study related to osteoarthritis. This study looks at serum urate level, um, predicts joint space narrowing in non-gout patients with medial knee osteoarthritis. This was published, Arthritis and Rheumatism, 2017. The question that was asked, does hyperuricemia contribute to the development or worsening of osteoarthritis? This was a longitudinal cohort study of patients with medial knee osteoarthritis with no history of gout. And why this is important, especially I think in the Middle East, uh, life expectancy um, is not great. I, I don't see too many people living beyond 80, the healthy, or beyond 75. And recently, I'm shocked by the numbers, even of the number of physicians dying early. And when we look at modifiable risk factors, uh, stress is something probably you cannot modify. We all live stress, uh, and uh, whether a patient or a physician. Uh, second, whether there is hyperlipidemia, increased weight. So uric acid may be one of the risk factors uh, not only for osteoarthritis, actually, but for uh, metabolic syndromes and coronary artery disease. And we have an unpublished work that we're finding it as a good marker even in patients with sarcoidosis. So in this study, uh, those patients did not have gout. So at, at the level of uh, 6.8, which is the crystallization level of, uh, of urate, uh, patients who had high level had more knee osteoarthritis at the end of the study, suggesting that uric acid level may play a role in the progression of knee osteoarthritis. Does that mean we should check uric acid level in all of us who are at risk of osteoarthritis and try to lower it? That's premature. But it is an eye-opening study, and I would say especially in men and postmenopausal women. This was a late-breaking abstract talked about osteoarthritis, safety and efficacy of tenizumab for the treatment of osteoarthritis of the hip, knee, uh, or the knee. Uh, tenizumab uh, is a humanized monoclonal antibody that blocks nerve growth factor. And there are multiple nerve growth factors now in clinical trials for the treatment of various types of pain. One of them is osteoarthritis pain. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center, parallel group study uh, of a 40-week study that showed that tenizumab, 2.5 milligram subcutaneously, provided significant pain relief and improved both function and patient global assessment in patients with osteoarthritis. We'll move on to inflammatory arthritis. There are a um, few new drugs approved by the United States for inflammatory arthritis. You talk about rheumatoid arthritis. In 2002, when I started doing clinical trials on rheumatoid arthritis, we didn't have that many drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, especially biologics. And I was fortunate to be involved, actually, in the DANCER study, reflex study, using B-cell depleting therapy in rheumatoid arthritis. And later on, we actually, I was one of the principal investigators for the ocrelizumab study in rheumatoid arthritis. But at that time, uh, ocrelizumab was the fully human monoclonal antibody against CD20. We ended up seeing more infection. The FDA stopped the study. We ended up publishing the study in ANR. This drug was efficacious, but later on, we realized that this drug, being humanized, should more cell-dependent cytotoxicity, more than B cell depleting um, uh, effect or antagonizing CD20 or apoptotic function, resulting in more infections. 
Now, ocrelizumab, as you know, is being used in multiple sclerosis and many other diseases. Uh, but the focus back then in, uh, was B-cell depleting therapy. You would hear mostly about etanercept, you would hear about infleximab and adalimumab. Uh, but since then, we have so many drugs approved over the last 10 years. However, in the last two years, uh, we have um, limited uh, drug approval in the field of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we have cerilumab, which is an, another anti-IL-6, approved 2017. And we have uh, baricitinib, which is uh, another JAK inhibitor, uh, approved in 2018. In the field of psoriatic arthritis, uh, we have two drugs approved, uh, Icaskinzinumab, um, and pardon the pronunciation, some of these are hard to pronounce, which is an anti-IL-17 approved 2017, and Tufacitinib um, is a JAK uh, kinase inhibitor uh, approved recently, and soon in the next few months you will see uh, TOFA as well among the guidelines of treatment of ulcerative colitis. Um, in the field of psoriasis, um, Gazakilumab is an IL-23 inhibitor approved for 2017 and Tildrakizumab, IL-23 approved in 2018. Now why this is important because as you know most of these drugs that are approved for psoriasis end up being tested a year later in psoriatic arthritis, two to three years later we'll have them tested in rheumatoid arthritis and then I'm the last one to test them in, in sarcoidosis because we wait until the drugs are tested in multiple diseases, then we use them uh, for sarcoidosis. We'll move on to another study that was published in um, the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, talking about tumor necrosis factor inhibitors and cancer recurrence in Swedish patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And this is a common question. You see a patient who had history of cancer, whether it's breast cancer, lung cancer, they have rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or ankylosing spondylitis. And they ask you, is it safe for me to take an anti-TNF drug? Is it safe to take a biologic? And the previous data suggested that there is no increased risk. A apparently, it is safe to proceed with these drugs, but keeping in mind uh, to consider case-by-case -case basis. So the question that was asked in this study, does the use of anti-TNF inhibitors increase the risk of recurrent cancer in patients with rheumatoid arthritis? This was a population-based study using national registry in Sweden, very large number of patients. So they looked at patients with rheumatoid arthritis and prior cancer versus patients without rheumatoid arthritis who had prior cancer. And they did extensive analysis. And actually, if you look at the statistics of this study, beautiful statistics were done, beautiful design. And the implications of the results um, is that uh, the results were consistent with prior studies, indicating no recurrence of cancer when using uh, TNF uh, inhibitors in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. However, a clinically meaningful risk cannot be completely ruled out. Now, what does that mean in terms of clinical practice, or would it change my practice? <clears throat> I'll tell you a story. I, I follow a patient uh, with both rheumatoid arthritis and sarcoidosis. So seven years ago, she developed breast cancer. Um, uh, actually, prior to that, I gave her a delimumab, and then she developed breast cancer. So her oncologist uh, told her, and she, the patient felt that adalimumab was the reason she developed breast cancer. So we stopped adalimumab, her arthritis went way out of control. I consulted probably with 10 top oncologists in the United States, and everybody told me, no, go ahead, continue adalimumab and add methotrexate if you wish. But I respected patient wishes. I thought, well, maybe adalimumab can contribute to cancer. I'm not going to give adalimumab. So she went on in cancer free for five years, ended up miserable from the uh, arthritis and progression of sarcoidosis. Uh, we chose to restart adalimumab. However, she developed hepatocellular carcinoma. So the hepatologist and the surgeon told me adalimumab is what caused her hepatocellular carcinoma. Stop the drug and don't use any biologic. The only biologic you're allowed to use is rituximab. 
Now, I have many cases like this in my clinic, whether patients had nasopharyngeal carcinoma, lung carcinoma, and you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So you look, for example, if, if a ctl 4 IG is mostly linked to lung cancer, and you have somebody who's a smoker with a lung nodule, with rheumatoid arthritis, it's using the clinical judgment at bedside, which remains better than any other study, to decide whether it, this medication is safe for your patient. There was a late-breaking abstract about rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, this was a randomized controlled trial of 24 week evaluating the safety and efficacy of blinded tapering uh, versus continuation of long-term prednisone, five milligrams per day in patients with rheumatoid arthritis who achieved low disease activity or remission on map. And why did I pick this uh, abstract, uh, late-breaking abstract? Because I felt there's the a big difference in our practice as physicians when we deal with rheumatoid arthritis. Some of us will keep patients on uh, low-dose corticosteroids, like five milligrams. Other may keep them in two milligrams. Other may keep them on 10. Some of us will believe there should be on zero prednisone with all the other medications we have. Now, it is important to keep in mind that even five milligrams of prednisone is not safe because that may cause osteoporosis, osteopenia, may increase coronary risk, or may even affect memory. So this study was useful because it showed us that rheumatoid arthritis patients achieving low disease activity while receiving tocilizumab and long-term glucocorticoid therapy at a dose of five milligram uh, per day should be considered for tapering uh, without uh, fearing that they will go into a flare. And I, I feel there are a lot of rheumatoid arthritis patients in Jordan, probably in the Middle East, who are maintained on at least maybe five to 7.5 milligram of prednisone. Uh, another late-breaking abstract uh, talked about comparative risk of venous thromboembolism with tofacitinib versus tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, which is a cohort study of RA patients. Uh, now, if you recall a few years ago, there were a couple of studies, one of them New England Journal of Medicine, about use of anti-TNF inhibitors, studies in vasculitis, and some of these studies were negative studies. But one of the things you've seen in this study, patients having increased risk of thromboembolic disease when they are treated with anti-TNF inhibitors. Actually, one of the uh, first cases um, it was, I believe, either Lancet or internal medicine, where a patient with sarcoidosis uh, received infleximab and died of pulmonary embolism, and then another patient developed cat catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. So what's the link between hypercoagulability and use of biologic? It's a, uh, a question that requires one full hour to discuss the, uh, the answers. But in this study, there was a higher but not significant risk for venous thromboembolism uh, comparing to facitinib versus TNF uh, inhibitors. Bottom line, if you have a patient who have hypercoagulability, it is important to stratify the risk before you select your medications and then select the biologic that has the least thromboembolic uh, effect. Uh, whether you need to screen everybody for antiphospholipid uh, syndrome or what would you screen for, that depends um, back to your clinical judgment. Rituximab safety in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, an 11-year follow-up observational study. Why did I select this? Because I hear from my colleagues uh, in Jordan, if you want to start a patient on biologic, it's extremely difficult to get these medications approved and you go through multiple hoops and probably rituximab may be easier uh, to, to give to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And it depends what you practice, whether you're private practice or academic center. Um, so the, in this study, uh, the, the authors looked at long-term exposure of rituximab, whether it has a good safety profile or not. And from 11-year uh, follow-up, uh, there seems low incidence of serious infections, no opportunistic infections, only the number of cycles and low serum IgG at any point during follow-up were associated with the development of infection. Now, from personal experience, I, uh, I have a couple of patients that I started rituximab in 2003, and those were enrolled in the Dancer Reflex clinical trial back then. I still follow these patients, 
since that time and dose them with rituximab yearly because they have contraindications to other biologics. Now, only one of those patients, when we were infusing rituximab, she developed prolonged QT and torsade. Now, we had a lengthy discussion back then with uh, whether we need to change the label, uh, but it is, if you look, it's on the label that there is prolonged QT, but it's not in the FDA labeling. Uh, so what I would encourage with any of the biologics, uh, regardless what the label would say, uh, screen for, uh, uh, for coronary risk, especially if patients take other medications that make prolonged QT interval, these, our biologic medications may cause hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, especially if you have a patient with multiple comorbidities and multiple other medications. Um, arrhythmias may occur, especially with prolonged QT. Procedures on joints. Is it safe to tap the joint or inject the joint if the patient is taking anticoagulants? Now, years ago, the Mayo Group uh, came up with that first study when they looked at uh, patients uh, receiving um, Coumadin, and um, it was, the conclusion was it's safe to tap the joint, uh, even if the INR is around 3 or 3.5, uh, as long as you use a small needle. But back then, we had only Coumadin uh, and Warfarin in the market. Now, this study looked at other anticoagulants, um, the question was, what is the risk of bleeding after arthrosynthesis for patients receiving oral anticoagulants? And which medications were studied? Uh, the Bigatran, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor, and uh, Rivaroxaban and Apixaban, uh, with, which are direct factor um, 10 um, inhibitors. And in this study, it was at Mayo Clinic, uh, published Mayo Clinic Proceedings, August 2017. Uh, this was a retrospective chart review study, uh, but it's the only study out there that uh, gives us safety signals if, if your patients are on those medications, arthrosynthesis and joint injection among patients taking direct oral anticoagulants is not associated with increased risk of bleeding. We'll move on to scleroderma. Uh, the highlight uh, this year of uh, scleroderma research was the uh, publication of the Scott study, which is myeloablative autologous stem cell transplantation for severe scleroderma, published New England Journal of Medicine, January 2018. Um, Keith Sullivan uh, was the senior, uh, was the lead author. Um, I was fortunate uh, to be uh, one of the investigators when we started organizing that study years ago. And I was supposed to be the cyclophosphamide hub rather than the transplant hub site, because when we were selecting the sites in the United States, even in the United States, we had to be extremely careful by selecting which transplant center will be the best center to conduct a stem cell transplant for patients with scleroderma. Um, but uh, the reason I um, wasn't included among the authors and I actually declined the study because our ethical committee at the University of Chicago back then decided that this study may not be ethical. How would we do stem cell transplant for patients with scleroderma? This is a very aggressive study. Uh, so the question here was, is myeloablation with stem cell transplantation more efficacious for diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis than a 12 month of IV cyclophosphamide. This was a randomized um, open label clinical trial, 36 patients in the transplant arm and 39 patients in the cyclophosphamide arm with a strict entry criteria. It was extremely, extremely difficult to recruit for that study and extremely stressful to explain it even to patients. As a clinical trialist, and I've been doing clinical trials for so many years, this was one of the hardest things I need to sit down with the patient and say, oh, this is what we have. And the patient would say, so doctor, I trust you. What would you advise me? If this was your family member, what would you advise them to do? And the conclusion from that study was um, the, the stem cell transplantation is a consideration for highly selected patients with severe disease because apparently, if you look at the primary outcome, which is composite of death 
um, modified random skin score and hack and event free survival it was a little bit better in the transplant arm but in select patients so it, it depends if you have a center that does it well in a select patients who are sick but not too sick to die from an infection then they would be good candidates for transplant because Again, uh, but the issue is what is the long term? I, I do have patients who had transplant 10 years ago thinking it's going to help their lungs and skin ulcers, and guess what? Now they're coming back with worse lung disease and worse skin ulcers. It, nothing really works great for scleroderma. Uh, so the question is uh, what's the least evil? Again, it depends where you practice and your comfort level, and if you have a good infectious disease team uh, and transplant team. Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, I selected this study, uh, which is the use of N3 fatty acid supplementation for treatment of dry eye disease, New England Journal of Medicine, 2018. Uh, all of us would love sometimes to take supplements. We think if we take maybe a little vitamin D or fish oil or vitamin E, we may look younger, we may feel healthier, more energy. There is little proof in the literature of uh, supplements making a difference with the exception of very few supplements. So this study looked at fish oil uh, and impact on dry eye, which included Sjogren's syndrome among other patients with dry eye. So the question was, does supplementation with oral and 3 fatty acids improve ocular symptoms in patients with dry eye? And the design and the method, this was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of oral N3 fatty acids for patients with moderate severe dry eye disease, including Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, there were 349 patients um, in the fatty acid um, uh, supplementation group and 170 in the placebo group. And the primary outcome was the mean change in the 12 item ocular surface disease index at 12 months. And the results were that the N3 fatty acid supplementation did not impact dry eye. So it is not recommended to be given because it's not, it's not very helpful in patients with dry eye. There was a late breaking abstract about Sjogren's syndrome, um, was a pilot randomized controlled trial, um, suggested clinical efficacy of combining loflanamide and hydroxychloroquine. This is sometimes one of my favorite combinations in patients where I cannot get biologics approved or paid by insurance. In the combination therapy helped in half of the patients. However, larger numbers are needed before a, a conclusion like this to be made. Systemic lupus. Is there anything really new in systemic lupus? We have two great talks about lupus, so I'm not uh, going to add much uh, to lupus. However, uh, there was an interesting study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine talking about the trends in systemic lupus mortality in the United States from 1968 until 2013. And the question was, has survival with lupus improved over the last several decades in the United States? And I assume we'll, ha we'll have the same results probably in the Middle East. This was a population-based study using national mortality database and census data and data on deaths from 1968 until 2013. The results were that mortality rates among people with lupus have decreased since 1968, but remain high relative to non-lupus mortality, and higher rates are among African-American patients and Hispanic versus uh, Caucasian. How about hydroxychloroquine blood level? We heard from previous talks how important hydroxychloroquine for lupus. So if there is one take home message, hydroxychloroquine is the only drug that improves outcome in lupus, and hydroxychloroquine is the most important drug for lupus. Is there a value of checking blood level? Blood level is commercially available right now. And per, um, one of the sessions about the debates, whether to check it or not to check it, led by Michelle Petrie and others at this ACR meeting. Conclusion was that blood levels are helpful in two ways. It will allow you to know if your patient is compliant with the treatment, and as, uh, furthermore, it will allow you uh, to perhaps judge on uh, retinal toxicity. We're seeing more and more of toxicity of 
the hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I have unpublished data, probably 25 patients with severe skin toxicity. They turn into grayish blue. So we try to take actually pictures before and after, and we don't know if that really correlates with retinal toxicity. Inflammatory myopathies, I will not cover inflammatory myopathies, I just listed the, what, um, uh, the classifications, whether it's dermatomyositis, polymyositis, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, or inclusion body myositis. And the reason I listed those uh, antibodies, um, because um, this uh, antibody, there has been a lot of discussion about it in the uh, ACR, which is MDA5. Uh, uh, so MDA5 is one of the antibodies linked to patients who present with a rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease, patients who will die within uh, three to six months. Uh, so if you encounter patients with um, inflammatory myopathy, especially dermatomyositis, polymyositis, or um, amyopathic dermatomyositis with such antibody, uh, be aware of how aggressive this disease in those patients may uh, die early from progressive interstitial lung disease. Uh, another highlight is the TEF1 gamma dermatomyositis. TEF1 uh, gamma is, it, you can check for TEF1, uh, commercially available. It's associated with severe skin disease, less interstitial lung disease, and increased risk of uh, cancer. And um, inclusion body myositis, one of the new things that was discussed is the presence of NT 5C1A antibody as a potential marker of inclusion um, body myositis. How about the treatment? There was a late breaking abstract talking about tofacitinib in refractory dermatomyositis, which was an open label study in refractory dermatomyositis, where tofacitinib demonstrated evidence of strong clinical efficacy. Um, as measured by validated myositis response criteria and chemokine levels in the blood. I believe this will be a randomized control trial soon. Uh, let me skip this slide and go to uh, fibromyalgia. Uh, fibromyalgia, uh, I, I listed this slide about revised criteria and in the revised criteria, I want to highlight the uh, number three, which is uh, sensitivity to pain, but no psychiatric conditions. So the new classification criteria divide the groups, uh, whether there are psychiatric conditions or not. And based on that, I think treatment will, uh, it will be helpful to put your patient into a classification criteria that will help you select the medication. So I presented this slide just to show you that there was a late-breaking abstract talking about uh, TENS uh, units as um, a method to reduce pain and fatigue and improve disease impact in women with fibromyalgia, and this was a large randomized control trial. How about vasculitis, a topic that's very dear to my heart. It's hard to cover all the advances in large vessel, small vessel, vasculitis, uh, or overlap vasculitis. Uh, this is an old slide. Uh, it, it still lists Wigner's granulomas, where the name is granulomatous polyangitis now. And there are two drugs that were approved for uh, vasculitis, uh, anti-IL-5, uh, mepolizumab for eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, and giant cell arthritis to silizumab. Um, there was an interesting study about PET scan use in, in diagnosis of giant cell arthritis. This was a prospective double-blind cross-sectional study that compared uh, the PET scan with ultrasound and high-resolution scalp MRI. The sample size was small, but this is an interesting study highlighting probably uh, the future role of using PET scan in the uh, diagnosis of arthritis. And we'll show you our data tomorrow in the diagnosis of uh, our titus in sarcoidosis using PET scan. How about inflammation and atherosclerosis? This is an interesting study looking at anti-inflammatory therapy with kinekinumab for atherosclerotic disease, New England Journal of Medicine, 2017. Can reduction in inflammation reduce the risk of coronary artery disease? 
And while this is not a rheumatology study, but I think it applies to a lot of our rheumatologic diseases. Um, in this study, three doses of three groups of kinekinumab, one placebo group, uh, were uh, studied among 10,000 patients with prior myocardial infarction and high sensitivity C-reactive protein that's high. And the primary endpoint was the, comp the composite of myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular death. Conclusion was treatment of inflammation with kinekinumab among patients with known coronary artery disease reduce the progression of atherosclerosis. Does that mean we need to be following high sensitivity C-reactive protein in our patients? Does that mean by not treating inflammation uh, adequately, we do increase the risk of heart disease? Well, there are a lot of studies already show that psoriatic arthritis patients, for example, are at increased risk of coronary artery disease. And if inflammation is not treated adequately, uh, coronary artery disease risk is increased. Uh, I, will, uh, go, I will cover this with the uh, FDA updates. So let me move on uh, to a new rheumatologic disease, which is called um, immune checkpoint um, inhibitors um, disease, or immune checkpoint inhibitors and autoimmunity. What are um, checkpoint proteins? Those are proteins that help keep the immune response in check and uh, help protect the body from cancer. So uh, if you have the binding, one of them is, for example, the PDL1. If you look at PDL1, it binds to PD1 and inhibits T cell killing of the tumor cells. If you target that and you block PD1, uh, you allow the T cell killing of the tumor cells. And there are multiple um, um, checkpoint inhibitors that are approved for many cancers. Uh, it's a huge list, from urogenital cancers to skin cancers. And the more use of these medications has been linked to uh, development of inflammatory arthritis, lupus, myositis, sarcoidosis, Sjogren's syndrome, vasculitis, and others. <coughs> How about FDA update on labeling? Uh, I <coughs> thought this is important for clinical practice. Um, there were a couple of studies looking at um, the risk of um, Celebrex, Celecoxib, uh, and the study showed that Celecoxib is non inferior to naproxen or ibuprofen in terms of cardiovascular risk. However, it's at the dose of 100 BID rather than higher dose. Uh, there isn't enough evidence to support clinically significant interaction between the study drug and aspirin. The FDA is evaluating now the deaths. Uh, related to the gout medication, Febizostat. So if there is a patient with a background coronary artery disease, be careful when you use Febizostat until the jury is out. The studies are ongoing. The analysis actually is ongoing right now. Codeine is contraindicated in the use of children less than 18. And FDA is requiring human and animal studies to assess the safety of gadolinium. So be careful when you order more than two to three MRIs with gadolinium a year. Now, in the last few minutes, I'll just show you a few pictures from my clinic since this is, uh, this is what I'm used to presenting, actually, clinical talks rather than updates. Um, uh, those are patients I've seen over the last 20 years in the United States. Uh, left upper corner, you see um, the, uh, this is the case uh, with um, sclerimix edema. Um, and sclerimix edema patients die within one year if, unless you do stem cell transplant or IVIG. This is a patient with nephrogenic systemic um, sclerosis, now, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, sorry. Um, this is a patient with Bichette ulcers. This is a patient who came with Bichette ulcer but had squamous cell carcinoma. And this is a case with calciphylaxis. And those are the cases I take care of with uh, severe rheumatoid vasculitis. I took care of this lady in 2005. Uh, she did actually well. On the upper panel, you see her severe ischemia, uh, but we were able to save the rest of the hand with aggressive therapy. And that's what um, encouraged me actually uh, to start the cold hand clinic and uh, establish a clinic for digital ischemia at the University of Illinois. And I established such a clinic actually before that at University of Chicago. 
So we deal with a lot of complex wounds, and you see the type of wounds. I'm sure you see similar wounds um, uh, from pyoderma gangrenosum to severe digital ischemia and a loss of um, digits and uh, to uh, severe Reynolds. Uh, I want to share with you, um, let me skip the studies that I did in Reynolds. Uh, let's go to some of the outcome. Uh, years ago, we were interested in a procedure called uh, periarterial sympathectomy. But while we tried to publish that paper, paper was rejected like seven times. So uh, although this procedure, unless done by good surgeons, uh, it won't, won't be successful. Cervical sympathectomy doesn't work, axillary doesn't work. But every finger here takes us three to four hours in the operating room. We strip the digital artery. But that's complicated sometimes by scarring, which results in more ischemia. And I can't tell you how many hands we saved over the years with this procedure, um, but we use it in select patients where other modalities cannot be worked. More recently, we moved into fat transfer. And fat transfer is still investigational. You'll find one or two citations published. But the way we do it, we have patients with severe digital ischemia and ulcers who failed multi-modalities. If they are thin scleroderma patients, we put them on the McDonald's diets. Why McDonald's diet? Because McDonald's is the cheapest thing and most of our patients are poor. So we have them eat three meals of McDonald's a day until they develop some abdominal fat. Women who have more fat or men don't mind it because we aspirate all the fat. We take the fat and we inject it in the fingers. It works, but it works for a few months, maybe six months to a year. But there, is, there are no clinical trials uh, to uh, and we're trying to study whether that will uh, change into stem cells, but the mechanistic arm is not there yet. Here you can see how the ulcer healed after fatty transfer, and here you can see in the feet how the blood flow improved. But again, that's not long-lasting. This is a patient, took me uh, four years almost to help, but he could not afford uh, seeing a plastic surgeon or seeing... Um, taking, doing any surgical procedures. <clears throat> this is a man with scleroderma. You see the severe Raynaud's in the left upper panel. Uh, but I used actually combination medical treatment, looking at the pathway, targeting endothelin, uh, improving blood flow. So in this particular case, I used low-dose mycophenolate, low-dose uh, corticosteroids, uh, sildenafil, uh, baby aspirin, statins, uh, and um, he's doing extremely well. He's able to work again. This is another case that we treated over the years. And you can see uh, after the severe digital ischemia, her only option actually was to attach her hand to her buttock for one year uh, for a graft or to amputate uh, the hand. But we decided to do multi-modality approach off-label including Flolan IV, actually. And um, you can see this is the most recent picture, actually, from last week. The first picture is from 2008. However, uh, uh, outcome measures do not exist in Raynaud's disease. So for, for the first time, actually, we were able to map the digital arteries. So this is a technique I'm doing with my colleagues at the University of Illinois called NOVA, which is a, a, an MRI software, MRI, MRA, but does not include gadolinium, does not include the dye. So it will allow us to image the blood vessels and measure the blood flow and measure the blood velocity. And we're hoping to start clinical trials uh, soon. This is a lady that we did the first case in the world to do small bowel transplant in a patient with scleroderma. This is a lady who had surgery. Uh, the surgeon ended up ligating the celiac uh, trunk. She ended up sloughing all her gut, so we had no option. So we were able to take a piece of bowel from her daughter. Uh, that as of speaking today, I saw her the, uh, last week. Uh, it's uh, five years since the transplant. We didn't publish this case yet, because every year we think, oh, is this real, what's happening? The other scleroderma features disappeared. So we're hoping in the future there will be uh, other treatments for scleroderma. I have only one minute, so let me uh, close by this case of Pichette syndrome with complex wound. Uh, this patient had severe ulcers in her arm. Uh, and actually, this is somebody who failed all biologics, CTLA-4, high-doses corticosteroids, including pulse, 
is a thioprin. Uh, I don't like thalidomide. I was going to use linalonamide in her case, but we could not get it approved. But finally, this is a combination of IVIG and etanercept, which is not a safe combination. I'm using it because I run out of options. Uh, but uh, her hand improved, and you can see the leg had complete recovery. And this is uh, a patient with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. I don't have the post picture, but with plasmapheresis actually in uh, steroids and mycophenolate, she's doing better and healing. And let's skip sarcoid because we're going to talk about sarcoid tomorrow. Uh, in conclusion, despite the recent advances in the treatment of rheumatologic diseases, there are a lot of unmet needs that deserve to be addressed. Individualized and personalized treatment approaches are warranted. Outcome measures need to be defined clearly. Translational team approach will be helpful. And I'll conclude by saying, uh, what is to give light is, must endure burning. And when I is replaced by we, even illness become wellness. Teamwork is the key. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this masterly uh, <coughs> overview. And uh, we certainly have lots of questions, but I don't know, there's no provision for discussion in, in the schedule. So perhaps we can take one pertinent question, a very pertinent one. I I'm happy to take questions after, during lunch and uh, okay. later. Yes. 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 Thank you. Just a couple of questions. The first one regarding the very first uh, paper you presented was NSAIDs versus uh, opioids. And uh, in that paper, the NSAIDs were improved or had a better pain prevention than opioids. Now, could this study not have been confounded by the fact that patients on opioids had a more severe <coughs> pain to begin with? And the second question, uh, relates to hydroxine, you said, is the only drug that improves outcome in lupus. Is that true? Uh, let me go first for the first question, which was the study uh, about non-steroidal, whether the patients who took the opioids have more severe pain. I think if you look, I'm happy to send you the link to the paper, if you look at the statistical analysis, they were adjusting for all these variables. And very true, those patients could have more severe pain, but it's impossible to design a study to answer that question without limitations. So I think even if we want to sit down and have a million dollars to design a study, we won't be able to design a study to answer the question. I think the goal of the study was to try to limit opiate use. Does that mean I will never use opioids in my patients? Absolutely not, because there are some patients who have renal insufficiency, I can't give them NSAIDs. So I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, okay? But great comment. Second question, uh, only drug that improves outcome. Actually, I was listening to an online lecture to Michelle Petrie two days ago, and that, those were her words, uh, maybe because I have a great uh, uh, interest in what she has to say as a leader in the field. If you look at the others, they may improve things, but they do not improve survival. Look at the study about survival in lupus. I can't tell you how many patients with lupus I give cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. I end up doing autopsy, they're full of TMA, or they die from infection in the ICU. Um, so we need more drugs for lupus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please.